and welcome. I'm Esther Allen, professor at City University of New York, and here with me today is writer, translator, and Penn Translation Committee co-chair, Lynn miller Lockman, another of the co-organizers of Translating the Future, the conference you are attending. Thank you, Esther, and thanks to all of you for joining us for week 19 of Translating the Future. Today's conversation on activist translation features Anton Hur, translator from the Korean and member of the translation collective Smoking Tigers, poet and translator Jen Hoffer, co-founder of the Language Justice and Experimentation Collaborative Antenna Ire, and Sevinj Turkan, translator and scholar of cross-cultural studies. You can learn more about all of them by reading their full bios on the Center for the Humanities site. In Jen Hoffer's bio, you can also find links to activist organizations that she and Antenna Airy have worked with, organizations which are now addressing critical issues arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. One of these organizations, MyCielo.org, works with indigenous women imp interpreters to end gender-based violence and provide language access rights, cultural preservation, and reproductive justice. Since March, MyCielo.org has made COVID-19 informational videos in a number of indigenous languages in order to transmit potentially life-saving information across language barriers into marginalized communities that are greatly at risk from the pandemic. Another organization you'll find a link to in Jen's bio is California Rural Legal Assistance at CRLA.org. In the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, CRLA is defending the rights of the essential workers in 22 California rural counties. They are among the most unseen members of our society. Those who harvest fruits and vegetables in the field, cook and deliver food, restock shelves, and clean homes and businesses. CRLA provides legal services and legal information to these high-risk, low-wage workers who, are, who belong to the most exploited communities and are facing the loss of homes, wages, jobs, and access to health care. If you'd like to pay tribute to the work of the activists speaking today, a great way to do that would to, be give, to give whatever support you can to the crucial work of these two organizations. Translating the Future will continue in its current form for just one more week. And then, beginning September 22, the conference finale, or week 20, will feature four gala evening events, with speakers to include Damian Searles, Ava Chin, Emily Wilson, Maria Davina Headley, Natalie Diaz, Ken Liu, Jennifer Croft, and a number of others. You can find out more on the Center for the Humanities website. We'll be back again on September 22 with the last, but certainly not the least, of our hour-long Tuesday conversations. This final one between Kate Briggs and Tracy K. Smith, moderated by Magdalena Edwards. Please join us for that at our regular hour of 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time next Tuesday. Translating the Future is convened by Pan America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by myself and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. If you have questions you'd like to ask today's speakers, please email your questions for Anton, Jen, and Sevinch to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. If you know anyone who is unable to join us for today's live stream, a recording, as always, will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Jen, Anton, and uh, Sevinch, 
We'd like to offer our utmost gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the CUNY Graduate Center, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, PEN America, and especially to the masters of dark Zoom magic at HowlRound who make this live stream possible. And now over to you three. Hello, Anton, Jan. Hi, I'm so happy to be here with you. And thank you so much to Esther and to Lynn and for everyone who made this possible. Hello, everyone. Um, super happy to be here. I'm delighted to be here among yourself. And with my gratitude to Esther, Ellen, and Allison. OK, so I guess. Um, yeah, <laughs> so um, it was really funny when uh, when I when I got when they proposed uh, this to me, this talk to me, and then I found out who else was on the panel, and I told my husband about it. I was like, "Oh, Jen, you know, Antenna Air Ari does all this, and you know, Savinch does all this," and then he looked at me and goes, "Are you sure that you're on the right panel? Because you're not ex you're not exactly like you know out on the front, you know." That's what our loves are for, right? To induce maximum skepticism? Yes. <laughs> and um, so I, and then I went back to the organizers and I asked, are you sure that you have the right person for this panel? And, and, and um, they assured me that, uh, well, you can talk about these things. So, uh, so these things are, are what I'm going to talk about. So for me, uh, translation as activism is, um, is actually a very, a, a very, very, um, important subject that I think about a lot. I feel that translation may be the purest form of advocacy and therefore activism, because um, if you think about it, what a translator does, you know, even if it's advocating for just one person or you know, lending their voice for just one person, it's still a form of advocacy and uh, a form of giving, uh, well, giving a voice is so patronizing. Um, Lending your voice is also patronizing. Allowing some, uh, lend, lending someone your platform, basically, of your language. That I feel uh, is, there's something very fundamentally activist about it. And connected to this idea is the idea that for uh, translators, um, like our existence itself, that you, is, is being an activist. For example, in so many cases, we, um, we have to sort of, how do I say this? Like, uh, for example, I'm gay and Asian. And so for me, the, uh, the fact that I have this identity sort of gives me uh, ways into empathizing, empathize, emphasizing with, um, with certain groups and certain combinations and intersections, perhaps more than people who did not have uh, these elements of the identity with me. Um, there's also something that uh, about translation where I feel that we don't just convert languages from one language to another. We also implicitly teach our listening and reading audience how to see and feel the person or book we're interpreting or translating. There are sort of like cues, um, attitudes, uh, respect that we give to our sources. And I feel that um, the audience and the reading public, they kind of, uh, I noticed that they pick up on that kind of thing a lot. And, and of course, there's the other kind of translator who are very, you know, racist or whatnot, whatnot, who uh, sort of like create a translation where you go, oh, this is sort of problematic. So in that, in that sense, uh, an activist translator would be someone who is more aware of this kind of thing and would be able to, to overcome that kind of um, problem. Um, for, I think, uh, the, the really big thing that I, I feel like maybe, maybe is not super duper activist in the, in the classical sense that we understand the word, uh, there's something very activist about, uh, for me, what book that we choose to translate. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're commissioned things all the time, but um, for example, uh, for Savinch, I think uh, that really amazing book, the Stone Building and Other Places by Asla Erdogan. So uh, when I read that book, um, 
and then I and then I looked up like the background behind it, and I realized that you know we we don't really hear a lot, we don't really read a lot of books by women from Asia, for example. Like it's it's not nowadays. There's there's a bit more, but more more on the um, the Northeast Asian kind of like China, Korea, Japan kind of sphere, and not so much. So and I also noticed that Seven uh, teaches um, women writers in around the world. And you would think that this is a this is a class that is offered, you know, everywhere. <laughs> it's not offered everywhere. <laughs> when I went to graduate school, I think we had one professor who taught women's writing, and she was, you know, she was hired like two years before I was a student. So it's it's a, there's still a lot of like work in that sphere that needs to be done, and it has to be done with with someone who has a kind of activist mindset. Um, the uh, other things so i so when i choose a work sometimes i'll be like oh this is queer so uh, i'm going to promote more queer literature in korea because i'm also a queer person and uh sangyong park who um who writes queer fiction is a sort of example of a writer who was never published in english and who had not published his first book yet but i kind of like thought okay i really need to translate this person and promote this person because no one else is going to do it except me and then he became a huge hit in Korea and now everyone wants to do him, but oh, no, too bad, I got it to him first. Um, the other example I have is perhaps, uh, it's, there's a book called The Underground Village. It is written by a communist uh, woman writer in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, a lot because Korea is, a, South Korea, uh, where I live and where I'm from, is a very McCarthyist, to this day, a very McCarthyist society. Uh, her work was heavily, heavily censored, and my translation of her work is really the is I think it's the first edition of her uh, of her work that was not censored by anti communist um, by anti communist censors. And um, kudos to the publisher, who's <laughs> very brave in publishing this because um, I kind of like pointed out to them that oh. This might be a bit dangerous for you. And then they were like, wait, really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, probably nothing's gonna happen. I mean, and it was after it was at the printers already, too late. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And then they came back to me with like, oh, like you maybe you should put this line in as well. So I was like, oh, okay. So so they're okay with it. Um, so there's that kind of uh, uh, so there's that kind of um, sensibility that was that is censored that we can also kind of like bring out as translators and these are sort of like the things that I thought of when we were um, wh when I thought about translation as activism um, the first the first story in in that book that Savinch translated the stone building in other places I think it's called the morning visitor uh, I I really feel like that book, that story sort of like perfectly encapsulates what it feels like to be a literary translator who has that kind of like activist mindset because there are all these people that just come up to the narrator or and tell them their terrible stories about their past. And the narrator doesn't necessarily want to listen to these stories, but at the same time, the narrator is the only person who can narrate these stories. Uh, so I feel like, yeah, that's basically what it feels like uh, for a literary translator sometimes. Like, Sometimes you'll read a story and you think, oh, this is a really terrible story, like, like a terrifying story. And I'm, I'm not going to be the same after I listen to this story or translate the story, but who else is gonna do it if I don't do it? And sometimes that's how I feel with some of my writers and some of the work that I translate. And so I feel like that story really is like a really, really that's how it feels like to me. And um, yes, I <laughs> took it away someone else. <laughs> Thank you, I, Anton, for your kind words. Um, I will reread that story with the point that you made just now. Uh, I never thought about it this way. Very interesting, very interesting. But I can see how that can have that interpretation. So um, sort of briefly to introduce myself, I translate across um, Turkish, Bulgarian, German, and English. You would probably ask how come uh, no, I did not have to devote the time and energy it takes to master four languages. I was born bilingual uh, in uh, Bulgaria to parents who identified themselves with um, Turkish ethnicity. So I grew up bilingual speaking Bulgarian and Turkish at home. In 1989, at the end of the Cold War, uh, my parents lost their citizenship. 
um, they were forced to leave the country. So we immigrated to Turkey. Um, and after age 11, I grew up in Istanbul, uh, where I attended college, where the language of uh, education was English. And after that, I uh, developed uh, some intense interest in German. Uh, I went to Berlin and Munich to study. Uh, my first job was a uh, conference interpreter in Strasbourg. Uh, and eventually, I completed a graduate degree here in the United States in comparative literature. Um, and uh, now I'm in Oberlin, Ohio, enjoying a visiting faculty position in the comparative literature department where I teach translation workshops and courses in comparative literature. Now, what brings me to this panel? Anton, as you mentioned, I guess it is the, the translation of the stone building and other places. However, several years ago, if you ask me, would I identify myself as an activist translator? I would probably say no. I, I would probably um, sort of hesitate assuming the title translator that came to me much later. Um, I, was, I was speaking about it as I translate. That was a safer space to occupy. Um, when I began translating the stone building in 2016, really publishing that translation was not on my mind. Um, I, was, I was mostly translating for very selfish reasons. I was curious about the process of translating. I was very much interested in Asla Erdogan's uh, language, what she was doing with the Turkish language, how she was flexing that language to create those very bizarre, strange images that populated the pages of the book. Um, I thought that would be quite a challenge for me to render in, in English. Uh, and uh, basically, I, was, I didn't know where I was going with that translation. Um, I also, as Anton mentioned, I was uh, going to teach a women in, in world literature course in that fall. And I thought, well, if I can come up with a translation, I can share that with my students. Asla Erdogan was not available in English at that time. Uh, so basically, this is what was motivating my translation practice. Um, indeed, publication was not on my mind at all. Um, the same year, August 2016, 16 August, August 16, uh, a date I will probably never forget. I was reading the news on the internet and I read that Asla Erdogan was arrested and imprisoned in Turkey. Um, so that was quite shocking. Um, that was a wake up call. And of course, all this comes after uh, July 2016 when the failed military coup took place in Turkey and its aftermath when uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his government began this very systematic crackdown on what they considered as dissent. Thousands of journalists, writers, um, academics, teachers, students were imprisoned just because of a tweet sometimes. They were intimidated. Uh, some of them got very afraid. They left the country. Uh, and Asla Erdogan was, was one of those people who were um, imprisoned. Uh, she was arrested on the pretext of being a member of terrorist organization. Um, and in the Turkish context, this basically means advocating for the rights of the Kurdish citizens. Uh, she remained in prison for about four months before even her trial began. Um, so indeed, uh, this was a wake up call. Uh, I realized that uh, maintaining a selfish translation in the drawer of my desk um, was a luxury I could not afford anymore. Um, I realized that unless that became a public discourse, um, it was useless. And this is when I began writing to uh, publishers, inquiring about their interest in publishing this fabulous woman writer from Turkey. And there was no interest, absolutely no interest. At the same time, I began writing to human rights organizations, uh, Pan America, Human Rights Watch. Uh, I ventured to write to uh, international award committees talking about this writer, talking about her work, uh, and stressing that she's in prison. Um, eventually, the, the stone building appeared. 
uh, on the shelf. That was 2018 and garnered some uh, significant international awards, uh, including Pen Translation Award. It was a finalist for Pen Translation Award, such an honor for me. Uh, but the point here is that uh, all this activity before even the book appeared in, in, in, in, uh, as a copy on the bookshelves, um, that brought a lot of attention to Asla Erdogan's case. It did put pressure on the uh, Turkish government to release her from prison. Um, it didn't look on good on the government to keep this writer in prison while she was receiving all these awards in Europe. Um, eventually they released her, um, but they kept a, a hold on her passport. She couldn't travel to one of her first award ceremonies uh, to which, which I attended on her behalf. Um, and, and I guess um, there is a lot to be said about the role of the translator in relation to this case. Uh, before I, I let Jen introduce us to the good things she's doing. Let me very briefly read from the Turkish so that you can hear the sound. Um, and I will read a little bit from my translation and then we can uh, come back and convene here. I will share with your permission my um, PowerPoint so that you can uh, see exactly what I'm reading. Tashbina, olgular açık, uyumsuz, kaba, yüksek sesle konuşmaya hevesli. Dev taşlar gibi yılmış olguları, önemli şeylerle ilgilenenlere bırakıyorum. Beni çeken yalnızca aralarındaki mırıldanma, belli belirsiz, saplantılı. Kayalar dolusu olguyu eşeleyerek elde edebileceğim bir avuç hakikatin ya da eskiden öyle denirdi. Şimdi ise bir adı yok, peşindeyim. Bir ışıltının ardından derinlere, en derinlere dalıp diplere ulaşır da geriye dönmeyi başarırsam, parmaklarımın arasından kayıp gidecek bir avuç kumun, kumların ezgisinin peşindeyim. Gerçeği söylemiş olur gölgeden söz eden. Hakikat gölgelerle konuşur. Bugün taş binadan, yazın köçe bucak kaçtığı, ya da güvenli bir mesafede durup sözcüklerin ardından baktığı taş binadan söz edeceğim. Benim doğumumdan çok önce inşa edilmiş, bodrumu saymazsak beş katlı girişinde basamaklar var. İnsan bedeniyle yazmalı, tenin altındaki çıplak savunmasız bedenle. Oysa sözcükler yalnızca başka sözcüklere seslenir. Bir H harfi alırsın, iki tane A, Y ve T, Hayat diye yazarsın. Tek sır harflerin yerini şaşırmamak. Efsanedeki gibi bir harfi düşürüp canlanan çamuru saf ölüme çevirmemek. Hayat diye yazıyorum. Bir soluktan çok derin bir iç çekmeyle onu koparıp alabilenlerin. Dalından bir meyveyi topraktan bir kökü koparırcasına. Sana kalansa boş bir kabuğa kolan dayadığında duyduğun uğultu. Hayat. İliğine, kemiğine dek emilmiş bir sözcük, iç sızıntısını andıran bir uğultu, okyanuslar dolusu oldu. And here's the stone building in English. The facts are obvious, contradictory, coarse and blaring. I leave the facts like a mound of giant stones to those who busy themselves with important matters. What interests me is the murmur among them indistinct, obsessive. Digging through the rock pile of facts, I'm after a handful of truths, or what used to be called that. These days, it doesn't have a name. Lured on by a flickering light. What if I were to dive deeper and deeper? If I could reach the bottom and make it back, I'm after a handful of sand. The song of the sand that slips through my fingers and disappears. Those who speak of the shadow speak the truth. Truth speaks through shadows. Today, I will speak of the stone building, the one that the narrative has avoided at all costs, or at least kept at a safe distance, looking out at it from behind words. Constructed long before I was born, it is five stories tall. It 
we don't count the basement and there are steps leading up to the entrance. One must write with the body, with the naked, defenseless body beneath the skin. Yet words only call out to other words. You take the letter L and F, a couple of vowels, I and E, and you write life. The only key is not to confuse the order. Misplace a letter and you turn the living clay into simple inert matter. As the legend goes, like in the legend, life as I write it belongs to those who can grab it with a deep sigh, not with a mere breath, like plucking a fruit from its branch, a root from the earth. As for you, what's left is but an echo, like the hum of waves that you hear when you hold an empty shell to your ear. Life, a word imbibed and consumed down to its very marrow, the hum of a wave of quiet grief, an ocean full of waves. Ah, uh, final word. Asla Erdogan lives in Germany in exile since September 2017 when she was able finally to travel to receive a very prestigious another award, the Erich Maria Remark Award. Um, the trial is pending. She was acquitted temporarily early this year. Although in July, the accusations have been review, renewed and the persecutors are asking for 16 years in prison. This is not a joke. Jan, it's your turn to share with us the good work you're doing. Thank you so much. I feel like I just want Sevinch to keep reading to me. <laughs> so I, I feel really, really blessed to be in company with the two of you. And also I've been listening to as many of the recordings as I can from this series. And it just feels like an incredible privilege to be part of this larger company um, that was so artfully and beautifully curated. Um, the last thing that you said, Sevinch, um, which is an update on um, the writer's um, current situation, which I really appreciate, makes me think about, um, you're think, talking about one person and how many thousands of people are affected by the regime in Turkey or in so many places. I do a lot of very close work with refugee communities as an interpreter. I also have people in my extended chosen family who are asylum seekers or asylum receivers. And I think about the incredible reverberations when one person or one family is subjected to that kind of brutality and the effects of that, and then how many tens or, or hundreds of thousands of people and just the incredible uh, sort of magnification of the pain and um, trauma that occurs and how much, um, just how much there is to deal with, how much that's in the air. Um, the word aire, antenna was originally conceived as antenna. It became antenna aire because we have two sister collectives that are locally based in Los Angeles and Houston, where JD Pluker, who is my beloved collaborator and was actually supposed to be on this panel, but couldn't be here today. Um, so shout out to them. Um, please look for their work, it's amazing. Um, when JD and I originally founded Antenna, it was just the two of us and just one collective. And um, the aesthetic work that we do that's based in cross language practice, which I'll talk about more in a moment, um, we think of as a kind of aire, a kind of air that permeates everything we do. And I'm uh, I'm coming to you from Tongva land in California. Um, I'm in Los Angeles where the air is extremely perme permeated at this moment um, by um, all kinds of particulate matter that comes from all kinds of places. And so that's both literal in my life and, all, and in many people's lives and also figurative in terms of thinking about the air of um, harm and pain that we breathe and then the responsibility to repair. And so I wanted to start by actually um, joining something that I heard Anton say and something that I heard Sevinch say that really moved me. Um, Anton, you kept apologizing for like not being an activist enough, which maybe is the mark of an activist the same way as a poet. I've always been like, I'm not really a poet, um, which sort of links then to Sevinch you saying, I prefer to say I translate rather than I am a translator. And I think what's important about both of those things, other than just like let go of what our expectations are for ourselves and let's just be who we are and see how we can meet up and engage with one another. Um, is that um, what you ended up talking about, Anton, was having an activist mindset in everything you do as a translator versus some kind of like action that an activist is supposed to take. Um, and language, I mean, we are language workers, that's what we do. Language touches everything we do. Um, 
and as does our approach to the collective responsibility and effort toward justice that touches everything we do. Um, so being an activist, as I think of it, is less about doing a particular action or putting my body or my efforts into particular kinds of spaces that are coded as activists. That's important to do. And some people have the capacity to do that and some people don't. Um, but it's more about a way of being and working. And similarly, to move towards saying I translate versus I am a translator is much more, uh, it keeps it verbal, right? It's more about what we do and how we do it and less about like I'm codifying who I am in the world. So in relationship to the work of Anthena Aide and also the idea that um, language touches everything we do, I wanted to start by um, sharing my screen and asking everyone, so at the beginning, um, and so when I do this, let's see. Um, okay, I actually can't see the Zoom screen anymore. So I'm gonna ask Anton or Sevinch, would one of you unmute and tell me that you can see what I'm showing on my screen? Cause I can't tell if you can or not. I'm hoping That's you can. Good. Great, thank you. Um, so this is a project that Antena Aire did. It's an experiment in participatory research called Responder Por Favor. You can access the slides um, at this, the link that I um, have on the screen. Um, which was also mentioned in the beautiful introduction. Um, so what I'm inviting folks to do is to respond on one of the following pages by typing into the text boxes um, to the following questions. I'm gonna read them in English. They appear in both English and Spanish on your screen. Um, where does language live in your body? Does the language you use belong to you? Or do you belong to it? If you'd like, describe what belonging means to you. And I'm gonna go back to the screen where you can access the slides. Um, which languages do you use daily? Which languages do you see or hear daily? Note, if you'd say you only use, see or hear English, ask yourself how many Englishes exist in your daily life? Imagine the ground you stand on as a body. Is that body made of words? Which ones? And then finally, what is one word you consider very much your own? Why? So what I'm hoping is that some of you will actually access this website and write into these blank boxes that the arrows are pointing to. And if you'd like to give us your name and email so we can catch up with you later, um, we will do that. Um, so you can access these slides anytime. Um, and I wanted to start with that um, to get out of my, there we go. Um, partly just to suggest um, how Anthena Aide is conceiving of language and cross language practice, um, I want to acknowledge that the work that JD and I do, we work between Spanish and English, which are both colonizing languages. Um, and those questions about language and power and language and colonization function differently in different spaces. So Spanish can be a colonizing language in Latin America and a colonized or marginalized language in the US. And I know that's true of many of the languages that we work between. But um, part of, um, I'm getting Zoom bombed by Cupcake the Cat. <laughs> um, part of our thinking is always about language dominance and how to unsettle not just the dominance of English in the US American context or the world context, because we know it exists there as well, but also how to unsettle the dominance of dominant Englishes. How can we access those other Englishes or those other Spanishes or those spaces, the multiple spaces between languages that for us often manifest in Spanglish, but I know that there's that lish ending to many other languages. My friends who are users of Chinese often talk about Chinglish um, or I was talking to a Malaysian colleague recently who was talking to me about Singlish um, or many other kinds of mixed languages and how do those activate our language and activate our thinking about language. Um, I wanna talk briefly about language justice, which is the framework that we use in doing on the ground cross-language work as interpreters and text translators and interpreter trainers and consultants with working with all kinds of groups um, from extremely grassroots community-based organizations to nonprofits, both large and small, to giant foundations, city governments, 
um, county governments, like all kinds of different organizations, um, some more flexible than others, let's just say. Um, but to think about language justice, um, that work that we do that's um, might be considered more concrete or more typically activist in the sense that you were maybe gesturing toward Anton, um, the ways that that work informs our aesthetic work and vice versa. So just to make sure that um, everyone is on the same page, so to speak, around the terms I'm using, um, when we think about language dominance, we're also thinking about linguicism, which is a term that I first encountered a couple of years ago, um, actually in work that I was doing in collaboration with California Rural Legal Assistance, which was mentioned at the um, top of the event. Um, linguicism is discrimination or oppression based on language. So it has all kinds of manifestations that we can think in terms of access to the justice system, access to healthcare, access to education, um, economic justice issues. Um, and it's very clear, I'm sure even just from that tiny laundry list that I just shared, the ways that linguicism intersects with so many of the other isms that we um, confront all of the time, racism, heterosexism, um, uh, misogyny, um, uh, and all kinds of other ableism, there's a lot of links between language justice and disability justice. Um, so the same way that we might say that racial justice is a response to racism, language justice is a response to linguicism. Um, as I said, it's very connected to the disability justice movement. We often think about the motto developed in the 70s by disability justice activists, nothing about us without us. And language justice at the root of language justice is the idea that those who are most impacted by any decision or any um, situation have a right to participate in strategizing around how to approach that situation. And the other heart of language justice is the idea that when we're able to use our own languages, which are preserved and respected and everybody's language rights are respected, we're able to bring our full selves into the spaces that we inhabit and the spaces where we work. Um, so that entails, um, and language justice suggests a set of principles and a set of practices, which I won't go into now because there isn't time, but if you're interested, I have a lot to say about it, um, as do uh, does everyone else who works with Antena Los Angeles, Antena Houston, and Antena Aire. Um, but language justice at heart also entails a kind of radical listening, where we are thinking differently about our relationship, the relationship of self to other or self to world. And I want to think back to something also that um, you said, Anton. Um, you were talking about um, the ways that your identity informs, the, and actually both of you spoke really powerfully when you talked about your language background seven inches. Well, you're talking about the ways that your identity informs the decisions you make as a translator. Um, and that it's not only about um, sort of converting languages or encountering the other in a kind of patronizing or patriarchal way, as we know so many translators have approached work in the past in that way. Um, and the kind of radical listening that's at the heart of language justice is really also about listening to the effect on us of the work that we do, the effect on us of the encounter of an encounter with a language or something that people are, are saying or thinking about that's outside what we know. So at the heart of language justice is also the idea that in order to be to participate fully in all of the spaces that we inhabit, we need to be able to hear something different than what we can access only through our own languages, that we need those things. Important, crucial things are being said or written elsewhere, that we need language workers like ourselves and language activists like ourselves to be able to access. Um, in terms of the ways that experimental writing and translation inform social justice practice and vice versa, I think you can probably see just from my even initial conceptualizing around how Antena Aide approaches our cross-language work. Um, and we do all kinds of aesthetic practice that's based in this kind of betweenness and radical listening. Um, but the ways that when we're thinking about um, the kinds of brutalities and the kinds of harms that we are breathing in in the air all the time and how we can be most conscious and most responsible to attending to those and to healing from those and repairing those, that that informs the way we practice artwork, but also the kind of um, radical leaps and imaginative openings that literary work, poetry, for me, especially experimental poetry, but of course, prose as well, can offer, can really inform the ways that we strategize on the ground social justice activism in terms of thinking completely outside the status quo frameworks that have been offered to us, which very obviously are not what we need anymore. 
So what else is out there? And those of us who work between languages and cultures, I think are uniquely positioned to approach the what else is out there question from a really revolutionary perspective. So I was gonna read a little bit from a couple of our pamphlets, but I actually feel like it would be maybe more um, dynamic to just open it up to everyone. And if it comes up that I'll read, um, I will. And if not, that's also totally fine. Our pamphlets are available for free on our website. So it's easy to access them if you want to. So I don't Jen, know. you should definitely read from the pamphlet, please. Okay, I could do that. Um, so I'm gonna read from two pamphlets. This one is called A Manifesto for Discomfortable Writing. Um, and as I said, if you go to our website, which is just um, antena, antena.org, it's in my bio, um, you can access these for free in either Spanish or English. Anyone who wants to translate them into another language, feel free. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna read really briefly from this. Language and world are inseparable. Language and action are inseparable. We use language to think about the world the world being language. We turn our minds and bodies to the language we are using, aware of the constant constraints and impositions of that language upon us. The language being the world, its multiple and multiplicitous brutalities, the perpetual brutalities of an unjust language, the perpetual possibilities of justice in language skipping a bunch. We have no patience for the divide between art practice and political practice. We have endless patience for doing the hard, imaginative and practical work of building a more humane and just world. We are here to dismantle the master's house. Audre Lorde, the master's house tools will never dismantle the master's house. Yvonne Rayner, you can dismantle the master's house using the master's tools if you expose the tools. Antena aire. The master's house began to collapse on its own long ago. Use any and all tools you can get your hands on and speed the process. Demolish the master's house carefully enough to recycle the building materials and make tiny houses for everybody. With any leftover materials, we'll make small books. So um, this is our manifesto for discomfortable writing, which sort of outlines our practice around experimental writing and house building and bookmaking. Um, and then we have a pamphlet called a manifesto for ultra translation. These pamphlets are bilingual. So you flip it and it's in Spanish. Um, let's see. So I actually, I had already marked to read this before I heard either of you speak, um, but yeah, I think you'll hear the resonances with some of what um, both of you said. Um, Work across languages needs contextualization. Ultra translation attempts to contextualize from within the language, within the syntax, between and around the words, the breath, the utterance, air and diaphragm contracting and relaxing. Ultra translation lures translators out of invisibility and onto the streets, into the margins, into the footnotes, into annotation, into activism, into failure, and into irrationality, the intuitive, a channeling. The work might speak for itself, but translation never does, nor can it be spoken for by the translator or by anyone else. Rather, translators speak for ourselves, addressing questions of stance, position, and perspective, replacing invisibility with transparency by writing notes toward an understanding of the tools and processes that made the translation, toward an understanding of the ultra translator's practice. Who we choose to translate is political. How we choose to translate is political. The politics of translation make us ultra skeptical and ultra committed. Ultra translation is built from radicalism, ultraism, anti racism, anti superiority, anti assimilation. We recognize and respect words, details, and impulses that cannot be translated, a constant divide. Both translation and its riotous cousin ultra translation provide tools for crossing or not crossing. Whether or not we cross, we need the tools. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you so much for that, uh, Jen. And and thanks to all three of you. I we're actually already at twelve forty five, and um, time to take questions. I don't know if uh, Lynn wants to come back on screen also. Um, but listening to the three of you, actually, I have a question that I'd like each of you to address, if you could. Um, it's it's been a fascinating uh, sort of. A uh, large scale tour of um, various uh, almost paratextual issues that have to do with um, uh, changing the canon, um, ex defending marginalized and imperiled individuals and communities, those oppressed by governments, um, uh, resistance to linguicism, which is this marvelous word that obviously needs to exist and that I had not heard before prior to today, Jen. So you've expanded my vocabulary and I very much appreciate that. Um, but I'm very curious and I suspect that a lot of people in the audience are also very curious for examples of activism that you engage in within the verbal fabric of a specific translation, you know, a specific choice that you've made as the translator of literary text that was an activist choice, um, be it with relation to pronouns or issues of gender, um, a, a use of multilingualism, a refusal to translate in certain contexts, or other concerns that may have impacted the way that you chose to put particular words or particular sentences into English. Um, could you could you each respond with? with something very, very specific in that sense, I'd really be grateful. Anton, you want to start? So um, I guess, I don't know how specific I can get with this, but with the, uh, there's a huge kind of debate between foreignization and domesticization and how, in other words, if I carry over the texture of the source, uh, source text or the source language into the translation, it may sound awkward or exotic. And I think I used to believe, I, I used to be completely anti-foreignization and now I'm not so sure. Now I feel like, well, now that I'm a little bit published than before, um, <laughs> there, yeah, there's there's fewer, unfortunately that's the, it's, that's the case where, um, now that there's less pressure to uh, to conform, I guess. So for so I find myself pushing back against edits more, where sometimes the edits would be very vague, like awkward, or <laughs> like awkward is a very big red flag that um, that I kind of like. That I say, oh, so awkward for who? Is it awkward for you? Is it awkward for this imaginary um, white reader in your mind? So. There, there, there are cases where I'm kind of like beginning to push back on that kind of thing more. Whereas if you see, if you look at my earlier work more, it's, it's like there's, I'm totally like always flattening things almost where kind of like sucks the, the life out of the language, I think. And I think that is a very big issue, a uh, very big uh, sea change in, in how translations are received now. I think um, Elena Ferrante's uh, translator, Anne Goldstein, I think she did a really great uh, push towards, um, no, I will, I will convey the texture. This is what it sounds like in Italian and you're just gonna have to get used to it and everyone got used to it. So I think that's a really great kind of tiny but gigantic form of activism uh, within the text. It's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, Maureen Freely, who translates Orhan Pamuk, or who used to translate Orhan Pamuk, has commented in an essay that Pamuk refused to allow her to use Turkish words in the translation, including the names of foods, you know, like Turkish foods that everyone knows by the Turkish term. She has to call like a burek a cheese pie or something like that, you know. Um, so seven, when you were translating, did that issue of multilingualism arise for you or other issues within the fabric of the text? Um, I think the example that I will give is sort of the, the, the, the, the, the third person singular pronoun in Turkish. Um, that is just the letter O which stands for he, she, it in English. Uh, that pronoun is genderless. 
Um, so how do you translate, especially the stone building, the novella in this collection that is full of awe? So the narrator, the voices that narrator hears. Huh? And so I choose to alternate all these three pronouns, he, she, and it. Uh, and sort of, what did I learn from this exercise? I mean, I guess the Turkish is, the Turkish values ambiguity, ambivalence, the delay, the deferral, uh, sort of an English forces you to be precise. Who is the person speaking? Tell me, what is their gender? And sort of that speaks a lot to uh, how languages really form our understanding of the world and our worldview. And we wake up to that is really at, during the, the translating process. Sort of language differences come and wake us up uh, from our uh, sort of uh, obliviousness. So that is the, the example that I give. And Jen, you? Yeah, I want to offer two things. First, I want to offer a lineage. It's very rare to be able to actually literally name who you learned a term from, but I want to name that I learned the term linguicism from Elena Uliash, who is the language justice manager at California Rural Legal Assistance, and we both learned it from someone whose name I'm sure I am going to mispronounce. Um, a Finnish linguist and scholar named Tove Skutnab Kangas. I'm going to put her name into the chat, which I know only those on the Zoom can see. Um, but just so that I'm giving credit where credit is due. And um, this Finnish scholar's work around linguicism is really, really amazing. And I really recommend that folks continue. It's just revolutionized my thinking about approaches to language to be able to name language oppression as its own thing and then interrelate it to other forms of discrimination and oppression. Um, so just to say, um, it may be me from whom you heard that term, Esther, but it is not only me who is using it and uh, sharing it with others. Um, in terms, so there's a particular term that I've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, I'm uh, about to publish uh, with um, a small press in New York, Lipnus Press, um, translations of a queer Uruguayan writer named Virginia Lucas. Um, her book is called Ame Rica Tu Valor de Cambio, or America, A ah, Mi Rich, A ah, Your Exchange Value. So you can immediately see the queerness and a kind of anti-capitalist um, focus in the title. And there's a poem that she has where she references a travesti. This word um, is kindred to, but is not transvestite, transgender, tranny, trans. It's none of those things and all of those things. It's specifically a Latin American term. And what I ended up doing was writing, using the word travesti, and then writing a footnote. I'm using a kind of radical um, intervention technique in translating this book, which um, is a much longer story, but Virginia uses footnotes in her own poems. And so then I'm inserting my translator's notes into the poem translations as well. Um, but that was an example where I couldn't find, there is no English language equivalent and sometimes adjacency is great. But in this instance, because it's about an identity and a, a, a kind of person who has a kind of way of moving through the world that's very particular, it really felt like a travesty. And I use the word travesty playfully on purpose in my translator's note to try to pin it down to a US-based phrase. I'm thinking about this word a lot because Antena Aire is doing a collaborative translation of an incredible Peruvian artist's work, Giuseppe Campuzano, who has a book titled The Travesti Museo, Museo El Museo Travesti del Peru, the um, Travesti Museum of Peru. So now we have the opportunity to think about that word in the book title and as it sort of extends through this entire giant project. I love that answer, Jen, because um, I, I think that people have always viewed translation as a vehicle for expanding the language, right? For bringing in new words, bringing in new, and that that would also be a political kind of activism has not necessarily been uh, understood at the same time. So I like that you're combining the, the, that very old traditional idea of translation as enrichment via new vocabulary with um, this political sense in which you're uh, in which you're taking it. And I think that Lynn has a question. Speak very quickly to the O that Sevinch was talking about. 
the way that trans people in the US are inviting us to think about the term they or trans and gender queer gender non conforming people are inviting us to think about they as a gender neutral pronoun. I think I think of that as linked to other languages that have gender neutrality and the ways that trans existence can actually inform translation are super interesting to me. Thanks for letting me break in. Go ahead, Lynn. Okay, uh, the question I have is another area of uh, translation activism, and that has to do with the publishing industry. Um, as Sevenches uh, experience points out, we don't often have the choice of what we translate, or if we translate something, we have to find a publisher that's willing to publish it and how do we deal with the fact that a lot of times the publishers that we deal with are investing in are invested in maintaining the status quo? That's a great question. Um, uh, great question. And uh, I, I do believe, I mean, I began by taking reservations with the title activist translator, but really translating in the Anglo-American context is resisting that context, sort of uh, alienating us from reaching out to international uh, literature, sort of restricting our access to international literature. And so translation, translating comes with an activist edge, you know it or not. Um, uh, so in my case, reach, Reaching out to publishers was a disaster. I felt like I'm beating a dead horse and this is not going to work. That the fact that this was a woman writer didn't matter, that she was a great writer, absolutely not. Finally, City Lights book from San Francisco uh, sort of showed interest and I, and I told, it, it, it, I couldn't have imagined a better home for, for the stone building. Um, and, and, and, and why? Because this is a publisher with a history of publishing banned books, uh, publishing uh, progressive politics. Um, uh, the history of the publisher goes back to B generation in the United States. They published several titles by Noam Chomsky. Uh, and so doing a little research about the publisher helps there. But I also, I think Anton has a, a great initiative with the smoking tigers. And that was a question that I sort of would like to build on and address uh, to him in that, seems like this is a, a initi initiative of solidarity Anton, among these translators who translate from Korean. And my question to you would be, how do you ne negotiate the US publishers um, demands that they want to publish a specific text from Korean and then sort of weaving into this your own agenda as translator? How do you negotiate that divide? Oh God, good question. How do we do it? Um... So I feel like an interesting thing that Smoking Tigers is going to do next year, or well, actually we did last year is, uh, but the books are coming out next year, is that we kind of started uh, Korean science fiction in publication. So like there was, there was no, there were no published books uh, of Korean literature, Korean science fiction literature in translation. And um, basically, we we all like I think four of us found like works that we really loved and we really pushed for for it and then we used everything in our arsenal. Um, it was it was very uh, like we were very lucky that Liu Tsushin's uh, Three Body Problem became such a big hit around that time. So for us, um, we are just so passionate about what about our authors and about the works that we want to push that I think um, publishers. Uh, do respond to that to uh, to an extent. Uh, they they see that like we they see that we are basically agents for some of these works. Um, it is an uphill battle, and uh, Korean literature is helped by uh, all these like fantastic um, institutions, <laughs> neoliberal institutions. <laughs> Korean literature, <laughs> that's fun Korean literature in translation without which it would be very, very, very difficult to, to, um, to enter into the system, um, which, which is why it, uh, some people tell us that, oh, why don't you set up your own publishing house? And we're like, 
wow, so we have to translate the books <laughs> and publish and them. Publish well. them. <laughs> yes. But then Jen, <laughs> Jen publishes uh, books. And so I feel like, uh, like Antenna Airy, uh, from what I understand, they're basically uh, vertically integrated. I'm sorry for using all these new liberal terms, <laughs> but <laughs> they're basically um, vertically integrated where um, like they have, they, they have experience of every step of, of the publication process. And, I thought, and I really wanted to ask uh, Jen that question uh, about like, what, what is that experience like of, of being a publisher? Because that is like such an incredibly proactive, um, banging your head repeatedly against the wall, trying to make things happen kind of level of having to do something. So I'm kind of like curious, horrified and in awe <laughs> of what you do. So I, I just wanted to ask you uh, about like what that experience is like for you. Well, it's already 10 o'clock, so maybe curious, horrified, and in awe is the note we have to end <laughs> on. But if you want, I was going to stand up and show you something. Sorry. It's, I'm, uh, so when you say that we publish, let me just be clear that this is a really good example of what we publish. This is a cartonera book. It's hand sewn. Um, it's just Xerox copy on the inside. It's a multilingual book that we did in collaboration with a few different amazing small presses, including Kodama Cartonera in Tijuana. Um, and um, just making sure I, I mentioned them all. Um, and Travieso Press, um, uh, Cartonera Santanera in Santa Ana, Kaya, which is an amazing um, Asian American and Asian diasporic um, literary press, um, and Tiny Slender Press here in Los Angeles. So. When we say we publish, we are making bilingual or multilingual DIY publications. If you want the kind of support that um, a City Lights can offer, don't come to Antena Aire. Mostly what we're doing is documenting and making um, sort of textured, homemade, um, objects you can hold in the hand, um, which also just in the pandemic, like so it's so important to have that physicality um, that we can share and trade and, and share with the people that we care about. So um, we are hardly um, a publishing company and I also would be horrified if we tried to be. Um, and I have so much respect for those who do that labor of love. And we do a lot of work in Antena Aire to create platforms to uplift the work of folks who do small independent press labors of love to support the work of the writers that we translate and ourselves as translators and writers. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, that's inspiring. Uh, you've all three been inspiring, um, but we do, we are at the end of our hour, so we have to say goodbye. And before we do, I just want to say that once again, we'd like to thank our partners, HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, also at CUNY. And of course, thanks most of all to today's wonderful speakers, uh, Anton, Jen, and Sevinch. We'll see everybody next Tuesday. And oh, a special tribute to Anton, for whom I believe it is currently 2 a.m. So <laughs> he wins the late night awards. All right, time to say goodbye. Thanks everybody. Signing off now. <laughs>